Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Coaches Parlay. We have with us Harry Mahesh, Mike Stackhouse, and Sean Mullen. Great to have all of you here, gentlemen. Thank you much for joining me. Today's discussion is the fact of bantam drafts and how important it is for these youngsters to get drafted. But the main question i got to ask you guys real quick in our first section that we're going to call the pregame whiteboard is it too young to start looking at players at this age? I mean, not only the pressures, but the outside, you know, forces that be parents, coaches, school, everything like that. Is it too young for these Bantam players to start thinking about moving into that junior level hockey? Let's start with you, Harry, up top, because you just finished a rookie camp this past weekend. And what did you see on the ice from these youngsters in this rookie camp? You know what, um, just to kind of right off the top answer the question, I think Bantam is too young. I mean, we only had uh, grade 10, 11, 12 at our camp. And even at that age, you can see the difference between somebody in grade 12 and somebody in grade 10 pretty quickly. Um, yeah, you know what, there's just, there's so many factors when it comes to determining a, a Bantam age kid, uh, size discrepancy. And, uh, you know, you can have, we have camps here, you have a kid who's six foot four in Bantam and a guy who's five foot three. So it varies quite a bit. Uh, I don't know if this is the full answer you want right now, but that's just kind of my early thoughts on, uh, on just yeah, in general. It being too Mike, bad. you see a five foot three guy, a six foot four guy. It's not the fight and the dog; it's the dog and the fight, right? But what about the maturity aspect of it from a senior in high school, from a kid that's you know grade ten, you know looking to make a make it a, a name for himself with the squad? Well, I just know you know to follow up on what Harry's saying. Um, you know, I, I speak a little bit from experience of my own son who uh, played junior football last year. If you'd have told me when he was in grade nine and 10 and maybe even grade 11, I'd have said there's absolutely no chance um, he plays junior football. And when he was in grade nine, I didn't even think he belonged on a football, theory, uh, football field, period. Um, but in grade 12, you know, something clicked and, and he was able to, uh, to parlay that into a junior football season. I'm, I'm in agreement with Harry. I, I think it's too young, but um, and we might get into this later in the show. I, I think, you know, it's too young, but you've almost got no choice because the NCAA, the Western Hockey League, everybody wants to get their meat hooks into the player as soon as they possibly can. And we see kids now 12 years old with agents. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what, what, what can be done to make it better or I don't better is the right word. Um, but I do think it's too young, but I think just the way things are going and, and with, so much on the line with NCAA teams, Western Hockey League teams, you know, families with, with agents and stuff like that. Um, it, it's too young, but it, it almost doesn't matter. Sean, the meat hooks are out. The players are going every which way, shape, or form. As a player, how are you able to, first off, put your efforts in the right place, your best foot forward, but then realize this is the next step to what I potentially want to do and that's learn or have that opportunity to play hockey uh, and have a great professional career. Well, I have, a, I have a number of thoughts on this. As for whether it's too young or not, I think the general trend in hockey period is that we're forcing players to grow up and make grown-up decisions mm -hmm. too young. 13-year-olds mm -hmm. moving away from home to, to play the game, away from their family and friends, you know, it's happening too soon. Players are being forced to grow up too soon. They're, they're losing too much of their childhood. That's the fact as far as I'm concerned. The other thing is, is it too young to judge players? I mean, as someone who followed the Western Hockey League very closely the last decade, I think it's a bit more of a crapshoot when you're drafting at 15 than if you drafted at 16, naturally. Um, I think of one player in particular, and I won't name names, ended up being a very late-round Bantam draft pick. He was tiny absolutely tiny like not playing size but uh the general manager who had selected him happened to know that he hadn't gone through uh the change yet so you're at an age there where that hasn't even happened yet and so that player ends up developing ends up going on to be an nhl player so you know it's it's soon it's early and for the league's sake when you're making a pick in the bantam draft you'd be a lot more certain of what player you're getting if it's one year later, the way they do it in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League and the Ontario Hockey League. But Mike pointed to the competitiveness, and Harry, the reality is, Harry pointed to it, the reality is right now, 
these leagues are trying to get a jump on this because 15 year olds are committing to the NCAA 14 year olds are committing and signing letters of intent. And if the Western hockey league moves their draft back to first year midget, instead of last year, Bantam, all of a sudden those schools have had just that much more time to wine and dine the players, get them down there, see the campuses. So I'm sure they feel like they've got to get in there as early as they can to make sure that they can convince those young men that the Western Hockey League is the way to go. From a player perspective, it does force you to make decisions early. However, we've seen time and time again that the Bantam drafts are not an impediment to a player having a future. If you're not selected in the Bantam draft and you happen to be a, a late bloomer and you come along at 16 or 17, the doors are still absolutely wide open for those guys. So I think it's a bigger issue for the teams. It's a bigger issue that it forces some of the high-end players to be make choices sooner than they should have to make them as young men in my mind. But for a player who didn't get a fair look, it doesn't really matter because those doors will open up. You go out there as a first year midget after not being picked in a Bantam draft and you score 50 goals, someone will have a spot for you. Yeah. You actually hit the nail on the head there, Sean. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come right back. We're going to hit the ice flying on the first period because you kind of touched on the topic that we're going to discuss in our next segment here on the Coach's Parlay. Stay with us. Here on the coaches parlay right before the break sean let's touched on and mike also touched on the competitiveness and how all the big guys the big players want to get the meat hooks in but it's not the be all and end all as sean said our discussion here for the first period okay you didn't make the bantam draft you didn't get that spot with your team with your junior squad what do you do next and i'm gonna ask harry this first because you saw them on the ice last weekend. You, you were able to look at their progress, yes or no. What do you tell that player that's not going to make your camp what to do next? Well, you know, going back even a couple of years ago, um, I coached a U16 AAA team out of Calgary. Um, it was right after the, the year after the Bantam draft, and I looked at every single guy and I said, who here was drafted in the Western League three or four months ago? And they all put, Nobody put their hand up. Okay, who's got a chip on their shoulder because of it? everybody's hand came up. The captain of my team that year is, you know, he's playing in the Western League, a couple other guys. They were listed within three or four months. They had buddies on other teams that were drafted that were delisted a week into the season. So it means a lot, you know, when you're 15 years old, 14 years old, it's a sense of pride, um, which I understand. But in terms of what to do next, I always followed the Bantam draft just through coaching minor hockey. And the first thing that 90% of people tweet out, including teams, is don't worry if – your draft. It doesn't mean anything yet. They still go through the process. You know, I think kids eventually will learn uh, a year or two out when they see that they've moved on past these guys who were drafted ahead of them or, you know, drafted at all. But you, you know, as a kid, there's only so much you can say. It's, it's disappointing like anything else in life. You know, you wanted something, you didn't get it. Uh, time heals everything. So to be honest, you, you just kind of say the cliche, it doesn't matter. You know, as a junior A coach, uh, do I care if they get drafted to the Western League? No. You know, we had a couple of kids here that we evaluated, and the first thing we said is, you know, he's in grade 10. Man, that kid, he's built for college hockey. He's got good speed, good this. Oh, he's already signed a letter of intent. He can't go. And I'm going, like, this guy is tailor-made for a college. And, you know, the vice versa, you look at a guy who's bigger and this, well, this guy looks like a Western League guy. Well, he wasn't drafted. Yeah. So it's funny how, as a coach, we can kind of see where we think this guy's route of success might be better. Well, the parent or the kid – or whoever is already kind of crisscrossed and decided they want to do something else. So I wish, and I, and I, I wish the parents would trust the experts a little bit more. We were talking about this this morning. It's, um, you know, I could sit down with a kid at 13 and, and tell their parents, 
with my honest unbiased opinion what I think they could do, you know, with the kids, you know, best intentions. And they just look at you like, no, this is what little Billy wants and this is what he's going to get. And if he doesn't, you know, so on and so on. But it just, you know, the people with the most education in this game are kind of the ones that get ignored. So, you know, it's really nothing you can say other than the cliche stuff. You touched on the first episode, Harry, how uh, refreshing it was not having the parents in and around camps. And I want to ask this question to Sean. Is it more important for the parents that little Johnny gets drafted or is it more important to Johnny himself that he can go around the classroom halls and say, yeah, I got drafted? I, I don't have the answer to that. I, I think What's it depends on the parent. On it? I, mean, that's a, you know. I, I think it depends on the parent, depends on the kid. There's some kids that put a whole bunch of a, a pride associated with that. And there's others that'll say, okay, no big deal. On to the next thing. There's some parents that'll really care about the status. And there's others that that's not the reason they have their kid in sports. So I, I can't give you the flat answer. What I can say is um, what drafting someone means is extra opportunity. It doesn't mean you don't get opportunity if you're not drafted, but if you're a first round draft pick or a second round draft pick, and then you're signed uh, at the Western League level, or if you're a first round draft pick in junior A, whatever the case may be, if a team is investing that capital in you, they're going to be more patient with you than they'd be with other players. So it does mean something. They're gonna give you more opportunities. They're gonna put you in more positions to succeed because they've already invested that capital in you because a first or second round draft pick means a lot to those teams. They're going to make sure they do everything they can to prove that they made the right call on that player. But that's really all it means uh, beyond the status and that opportunity, because if you don't get drafted in the fifth or the sixth or the seventh or eighth or ninth round, that's really irrelevant. What matters is what you do next. And I've seen it over and over again. There's names that get called out in the seventh, eighth, ninth round, even the fourth, that you'll never, ever hear again. And then all of a sudden, a guy will show up, have put on 20 pounds, have added an extra layer to their game as a first-year midget, and they're on a second line in the Western League. They get 16, 17, or they're putting up 60 points in the Manitoba or Saskatchewan League. It, it's irrelevant, really, if you're a late round pick or not, I guess you get to go to some camps, you get to say you're drafted, but that's not going to make that next step for you. Uh, the only, the high picks, they'll get more chances. The lower picks, it's all about what you do next. And so if you're not picked or you're a lower pick, it doesn't really matter. What matters is how you perform. Last time I checked, I had my second growth spurt around the age of 16, which should have been the year after my Bantam draft. Now, Mike, Talk about the potential and why how the far, potential. How far did that get you? Look where I am. Look where I'm doing right now, Don. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that shows the academics over the athletics, the, the pride and the prejudice of English literature, uh, the parody of learning about anatomy and biomechanics. I could go on and on. Uh, coaching USA Hockey, U17 programs in Southwestern California. Of course, Southwest United States, I loved it. How far did it get me on the ice? Not very far. Yeah. Got me a free pair of skates and that's about it and a couple of marshmallows. But the bottom line was my potential wasn't met at that time. Uh, and I see so many players, as all of we have seen, probably hundreds of thousands of players that have gone through a system that is not flawed, but if you hit your stride at 15 and you've got your ducks in a row and you're not going through a growth spurt and you still have your hand-eye coordination and you're pop popping 80 points so you got 65 70 pims up there you're getting looked at and like i want to ask you this question that potential it's kind of alluded what sean was saying the door isn't closed but really i mean we, there's so many great examples of players that have bloomed later on in their career and i say in their high school career when they played midget one or u18 They've seen those doors still open for them, Mike. Give us a bit of your idea of what you think about Bantam drafts, drafted or not, and what does it mean for the player? And like you said, Sean, it's more important for the team to have its spots filled in, right? Yeah, well, I think, you know, for me, you talk about players developing late. Um, probably the best player I've seen play junior A hockey was Chance Petruic last year as a 20-year-old. 
and he had a shot in the Western Hockey League, didn't uh, pan out for him there. Um, and his growth, even from 19 to 20, um, was remarkable. And to think that, by and large, he's written off as a potential NHL player because he's too old, 20 years old, just blows my mind. I mean, this guy can skate. He's got one of the best shots I've ever seen in junior A hockey. But he's 20, so he doesn't count, I guess. You know, as, as far as, you know, the Bantam – you know, and, and development and, and things like that. And, and Harry talked about it a little bit. I, I always tell families, I mean, if you're, if you're a special player and someone is going to hand something to you when you're 14 and say, we're going to guarantee you a four year scholarship or, or, or whatever it is that, that happens when you're 13 or 14, and unless that's happening to you, I think you got to keep all your options open. And I always tell families and, and, and parents when, I, when I'm talking to them, you know, what do you want to do? Don't do something that prevents you from keeping your eye on the prize or becoming what you want to be. If, you, if you've if you always wanted to play in the Western League, you didn't make the Western League and you're playing Junior A um, and the Western League comes calling to you partway through your 18-year-old year or your 19-year-old year, if you're confident in your ability, Take it. Uh, you know, you, you only you only live once. I mean, there's there's no sure thing that you're going to get a scholarship either. If you're if you're two months into a 19 year old year, you're having a good year. There's still no assurances that that you're you're going to get a scholarship. There's no assurances. You know, some kids, you know, which we we often overlook actually, aren't cut out for school. They just they can't juggle sports and and academics, and it. It's, it's just not really for them. And, you know, yeah, they might be, and Harry alluded to it. I, I've seen the same thing. I see kids all the time that, you know, yeah, you're, you're probably better suited for a college game, but your brain isn't suited for college necessarily. And so if you've got that opportunity to go to the Western League, I, I think most kids, and I mean, I know I'm a big junior A guy, but I'm also a big Western League guy. And I, I, I always feel that if you're, if you're a kid and you're coming on a bantam, midget, whatever the case may be, I think the goal should always be play as high a level as you can possibly play, and things will eventually fall into place for you if you're good enough. And like Sean mentioned, the opportunities. Like if you're not drafted, but you're still putting up numbers, you're going to get opportunities. I, I see every year, you know, guys that you know come through the, the bantam midget ranks. They aren't drafted but they end up being pretty good junior A players at 17 and 18 and Western league still comes calling for those guys. So, um, you know, it goes to the, you know, a little bit to the, to the late blooming. It goes a little bit to, you know, some guys are just overlooked, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the question about the social status and whether it means for the kid or for the parent, um, you know, parents don't believe this, but it's absolutely true. If you're a dad and you're a nightmare to deal with, your kid will not be picked where he should be picked because teams don't want to deal with you. They just don't. And that's a fact of life. And and, and I hear it all the time from, from uh, junior A teams, especially but Western league teams will do it too. Unless you're really, really good. They'll say, well, you know what? He's pretty good, but you know, dad's a nightmare and calls all the time. But this other kid over here, he's almost as good, really good family. We'll pick him. All things being equal, yeah. Harry, touch on that real quick. How much you love parents? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that, that's exactly it. I mean, I I've dealt with it enough, and I will take a less of a headache if it means a player is slightly below. But you know what? That just means I got to coach that much harder and do my job a little bit better. And that's ultimately what it comes to. And, par- and yeah, that's exactly it. Parents, they just don't realize. And you know what? There's great parents too. Like I don't yeah. want. to like yeah. it's all, you know, like, um, you know, it's always negative in the hockey world, which seems to be a perception. But, you know, at a certain point, the kids who are on that small percentage, the elite of the elite, they just it's, they get guided properly. You know, they'll have people approach them. But it's that second tier where it's kind of people are flighting, scratching and clawing. And that's when you see the, the misdirection, you know, and that's when you see the parents try to step on front. And that's too bad because in that second wave of kids, is mm-hmm. where the potential lies, but you just need more time. 
So, you know, it can very easily get derailed by something that has nothing to do with hockey. Um, but, so I think it's really important to, you know, to take your time and, yeah, not get too caught up in every little detail of every little year. Yeah, don't be in too much of a rush because we see it all the time that these guys don't develop in a straight line. It's a curve. It changes. One year you shoot up, the other year you only develop this much. And the way that things have been set up, that there's so much pressure and expectation put on each step that you take. Did you get drafted? Did you make the roster at 16? Are you putting up numbers as a 16 or 17 year old? Did you get drafted your first time around in the NHL draft? And the players end up putting so much pressure on themselves because there's so much hype around those scenarios only to not realize that these are just steps. And it's not a cliche when coaches and managers say, this is just a step. This doesn't guarantee you anything. All that matters is what you do next. You don't get drafted in the NHL. If you put up 50, 60, 70 goals as a 20 year old in the Western league, there's teams hovering around you waiting for a shot at you. If you're not drafted, how many guys end up graduating NCAA teams? And they're that free agent that 30 teams call the day of the NCAA season's over or Canadian University, the most underrated hockey in the entire world, as far as I'm concerned. You got guys like Joel Ward or Andrew Brunette who weren't on the NHL radar. They go get an education, play high-level hockey in Canada, end up having long NHL careers. The chances that are available to play hockey in Europe, the chances that are available to play semi-pro hockey. So all these people that put so much pressure on what happened when you're 15, what happened when you're 17, like that's the end of the road. It's just the next step. And they've got to sort of back off that with kids because as a teenager, your emotions and your hormones, the way you are, if you carry those highs and lows, it could wreck a life and a career if you put too much pressure on just one aspect of a development curve. You know, and just to tack on to that, Sean, I think, too, the other thing that, that we don't tell or teach kids enough is, is how to be a good teammate. You know, if you're if you're 15, and I'll, I'll go back to my son again, when he was in uh, grade 10, uh, it looked like he was going to be the starting quarterback, which is unheard of. They just they didn't have anybody, and he was in line to be the starting quarterback. Turns out the final week of practice before school starts, uh, a kid from Saskatoon moves into Yorkton. He's in grade 12, and he's a pretty good quarterback, so he ends up becoming the starting quarterback. Of course, my kid comes home. He's sour about it. And I said, no, you know what? You actually have a really good opportunity here because you can watch an older player, see what he does, see what he does right, see what he doesn't do right, and actually support him and be that good teammate because by the time you're in grade 12, you're going to need that same support from a grade 10 quarterback. And the same is true in hockey. I think when you're, you know, if you're 15 and you think you should be in the top six and you're not in the top six, that doesn't mean you won't be in the top six at 16. It doesn't mean that um, you're a bad player, but it, it, it does mean that you should maybe watch and learn and see what is it about one of those guys that's in your top six? What makes him a top six player? What can I do to become a top six player? And I think like, Coaches, I think Harry will, will say, you love players who are happy being on the third and fourth line, but think they should still be on the first and second line. And that ultimately is what makes for a really good team. And I, I'll go back to another another player years ago, uh, Jordan Schindel, who played for the Humboldt Broncos. He was a fourth line player at, at, um, at 18 and, in fact, was sent back to Junior B after the first month then at 19, made the team, was a healthy scratch in the season's first game, and at the end of the year was the MVP of our playoffs. But, He's that firefighter in Saskatoon. He's a pretty good contributor to society as a whole, not just hockey. I, I remember when, when Mark Lamb was the coach in Swift Current. Uh, they had a bad team my first year there, and he came under massive criticism because – bad team. Why are you playing veterans? Why don't you put the young guys out there on the first line? And, and he would repeat over and over again, I throw a 16 year old who's not ready out there for that role against the best players in the league. And he sinks, he gets eaten alive. It destroys his confidence. He can't develop properly just to satiate the fan base or the parent or the player. And that ruins his development. 
you have to put players in a position to succeed and to grow and develop. If they're ready for it, that's great. If they're not ready for it, you could really hurt them. I'm sure Harry knows that better than I would, but that that was well, the method that always came out. Harry, we finish this off for us. Yeah, we have a crop of all fours, which is grade 11, that we're sitting there, you know, with our mouth watering, thinking these kids are going to be awesome. But there's no sense in them being here with us now. Like, they need to go back to AAA, dominate, get comfortable putting the puck in the net. But, you know, as much as, we, you know, it'd be great to have them here for the experience, you go a month without scoring with our condensed schedule, that's going to that's gonna affect you, right? So as much as there's good players we're going to send back, and then kind of building off to what Mike said, you know, we have two guys that are graduated from AAA, 18 years old. One had 60 points, the other had 20. Well, we're looking at who's going to be our third, fourth line. You know, the guy with more points may be the better player, but is he going to be able to adapt to the role we need? Or this guy who's done it for a couple of years. So, you know, again, who's the better player? Okay, maybe the guy who scores more points, but who do we need? Well, maybe it's the guy who's used to playing on the third, fourth line. So you get, as you go up in hockey, you know, the best players in the world aren't all playing in the NHL. That's a fact. They're playing in the K. There's guys in the American League who are first liners who are better than the other team's fourth liner. You know, it just it becomes a competition based and need. So, yeah, you know, kids are always going to be sour. I'm better than this player. Unfortunately, that's not what that team needs. So, you know, it's just how we're it going to hit the buzzer here, boys. Great talk during the first period. Competition of those players, support, like Mike said, to succeed. And let's not forget that that apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Fathers, make sure you're listening out there. We'll be right back here with the second period on the Coach's Parlay. Lots of good talk there during the first. We're back here with the second period. We're going to dive into some books. I know I know. I got to ask my boys here on the bottom. Team Fuchsia versus Team Black. I like how we did that today, boys. Uh, organized well. Just got to say that real good. Um, Red, I got a bad job. I think, I think uh, Sean's got the uh, – got a little bit not, not as great water where he's at compared to Mike. Mike's <laughs> color's holding up a little bit better. But uh, – it's a Sean, hard, it's hard really water. We need we need water softeners around here. I totally I, and I have one, but I I choose black for a different color. I'm not going to someone's uh, funeral just yet. But I got to ask the boys at the bottom because or all three of you actually drafted, listed, lists, protective players. All this stuff is always confusing to me. Sean, real quick, explain to us what it means to be drafted. And then how that converts to a listed player for each team. Well, in the Western Hockey League is what I can answer. Uh, I, I couldn't give you a detail how it works elsewhere, but there's a certain number of players you can have on your protected list. So if you draft somebody, they automatically go on to it. And then you have a bunch of other spaces. And then you can fill those players with undrafted players or previously drafted players who are now free agents. You can list those players and then they become your property and you can trade them if they don't want to come play for you or you can bring them to camp and etc. However, um, if they're not going to be part of your plans, then it's best to, you know, take them off your list, give them a chance to go somewhere else where there'd be an opportunity for them. So um, it's, it's like a whole, once the draft is over, there's kind of a scramble for players that were maybe close to a Bantam draft level that teams will go out and want to add to their list. And then they follow guys who didn't get drafted and try to snag them as they're on the up curve, right? It's the scouting job doesn't end with the Bantam draft. They, they look at that first year midget player and they see, Oh boy, he put on 20 pounds and he grew three inches over the summer. Let's list him now. Or it's that game you play because you only have so many spots. And a, a lot of times before the Bantam draft, you'll see Western league teams culling their list because they have to make room for the, the new draft picks that come in. The other thing that happens too is if a guy is playing NCAA, they have a special spot in your list that doesn't count to your total. 
Um, so you're allowed to keep their rights should they decide to come back and play in the Western Hockey League rather than stay in the NCAA. Um, so there's kind of some exceptions that exist on those lists. But, yeah, it's another tool for trying to find players that slip through the cracks. And you don't have to get them to agree. So you can list them and – they'll have no idea that you did it. And then you become their destination for the Western Hockey League if they want to go that way. So just a quick follow-up question before we get to Mike and Harry here. With regards to how the seasons are shaping up and we don't know how interprovincial travel is going to work, do you suspect to see WHL teams allowing players to go down to junior playing levels? Or do you see that not happening this year and maintaining their list protected and, you know, as up to date so they stay with the same team in the dub? Well, being listed doesn't mean you can't play junior A. It just means if you had signed with that team, um, then by signing and being added to their roster, then they can dictate whether or not you're allowed to go back and play junior A because you've signed with them, right? Um, so if you're currently on the roster, you can't just leave and go play unless you have permission to do so. But if you're just a listed player or a drafted player, then you can go and play wherever you want. Now, as for guys who are currently on the roster, will Western league teams allow them to go play junior a, I suspect that's a player by player decision. You know, if, if you've got a superstar who's expected to be your first line center, do you want him to spend uh, two months in November, you know, October, November, wherever the case may be, going out there and risking injury just to stay sharp, or would you rather him just work out? Probably that. If it's a bubble player that you don't know whether he's going to be on your roster or not, then I think you might be more inclined to say, go out there and, and you know, get a chance to play. You might not even make our team, so I don't want to hold you back. I, I think you might see some examples of that. And it may also depend – really what the, the families and the kids say. You know, if, if you have a player who's from Winnipeg or Steinbach or Yorkton and he's listed by the Vancouver Giants, that family may not feel comfortable sending that player to Vancouver this year. And if, if they're a player that was only marginally in their plans, teams will probably have some level of sympathy and understanding for that. But if that guy's going to be your first line center or your starting goaltender, that's a different story. Mike, chime in here on the SJ. What's going to happen to some of these uh, lists that are going on here uh, this upcoming year? Well, I mean, in, in Saskatchewan, we've got A list, B list, C list. In a nutshell, your A list is your, is your main list of guys. Your B list would be guys that are in your uh, city. So for Yorkton, anybody that is from Yorkton that they might want to have on their team, they would add to their, to their B list. And then your C list would be guys that were at one time or another on your A or B list, but ended up playing major junior. So you would, you would move them to your C list. It does get a little bit complicated in that. And I'll give a, I'll try and go quick, but like Caden Korzak is from, is from Yorkton. He never played for the Terriers. So he actually is still on their B list. He doesn't have to go to the C list because he never actually played for the Terriers at any time. So it does get a little bit, tricky you know with what list uh, a, a player might be on the, the one thing that i would say to families though and i have seen this quite often in the junior a ranks you get a player who's 16 uh and and is headed to the western hockey league the junior a team will say hey look why don't you sign a card you you know if, if it doesn't work out for you in medicine hat or red deer wherever you're going you can come back and play for us. So, you know, it just sign a card. And as long as you sign a card, you know, you can come back and play for us. And that might be fine at 16. But what happens with some players is that they'll sign that junior A card at 16. They'll go to the Western Hockey League. They'll play at 16, 17, 18. Then at 19 or 20, they're all done in the Western Hockey League and they got to go back and play junior A. But you've built a pretty good Western Hockey League career. You've got four years on your resume you're a pretty good hockey player all of a sudden you become available and there's a lot of junior a teams that want you the problem with that is that if you signed a card at 16 you got to go back to the team that you signed the card with and i'll give a really quick example um justin leclerc was a goaltender from saskatoon 
And he played in the Western Hockey League, I think, for four years. But he played one game for Melville at the uh, showcase in September when he was 16. Melville had two injured goalkeepers, and LeClaire was playing, I think, for the contacts at the time, the midget team. And Jamie Feasel said, hey, look, sign a card and play a game for us. We, we, we you know, our goalies are hurt. Uh, you may as well get some experience. So they said, okay. So he played the one game. He then went to the Western League, played four years in the Western League. And when his time in the Western League was up, uh, he ended up skating with the junior A team in, in BC, at which time Melville made a phone call and said, you're tampering with our player. Right. So be careful, you know, if you, you know, if you don't ever have, and I, you know, with all due defense to, uh, you know, the Leclerc's at the time, they never had any intention of ever playing in Melville. But what it did was it allowed Melville to make a trade and they got some assets for him in the end uh, to sort of, sort of help their team. And some junior A coaches, I think if they're, if they're smart, they'll get some of their major junior kids at 16 to sign cards because what it does is that you never know what will happen at 19 and 20. And even if there's a change of heart, they don't want to play for you at 19 and 20. You've at least got an asset and you can get something for him. The downside for that as a family is that you no longer control where you're going to go to if your time in the Western League comes to an end. Ryan, touch base. Thanks for joining us, first of all, Ryan. A little late to the show. We needed a centerman. I'm glad you're wearing blue to kind of work on the – make sure you got the blue jersey going on today. Uh, your expertise is a little bit of scouting from all over North America, north border, south of the border. How does it, you know, when you look at players that are coming into finishing off high school, they're not drafted, and they're potentially going to go play D1 or D3, or they're looking to play in a junior league, how do you, what does it mean to a player, and how do they, you know, look to be put into the best perspective, I guess, to further their career to where they want to play later on in life. Well, sorry guys. Uh, I was uh, living in just outside of Toronto. Raptors were in a pretty tight game and I, and I lost. I know, track of I know, I know. Double overtime. I know. I, know. <laughs> so I apologize it's about that. It's kind of a big deal. I, it's kind of a big deal. I know. Yeah. Well, um, and just to kind of touch on what Mike was saying um, and, and, and to answer your question, I mean, there's so many options available in junior hockey across Canada for players. And uh, if you're coaching the MJ and then also being in the Northern Ontario Junior League, every league is ran completely different as well. I mean, there's no lists or uh, or drafts in Ontario. It's open borders. You, you kind of play with wherever you need to play and, and you recruit. And that's how you build your rosters, right? Where in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, you, you, you get to draft and um, – you know, those players right belong to you, which, you know, now uh, with pay to play hockey um, kind of coming into some junior programs, I'm a big proponent of if, if I'm a paying customer, I want to pay money to play on the team that I want to pay the money for. And um, I think that, that that is something that that needs to be addressed in, in a lot of the different uh, ways that players are, are put uh, on some of the teams. But um the options are there and, and the player needs to go to the best team. That's going to get them the most ice time and the ma most exposure. And I mean, you can look at the commitment levels of all the junior A teams and, and leagues across Canada. And what are the leagues that are pumping out the most commitments at the D one level and the D three level, um, the D one level, it's pretty evident that the BCHL and seems to be taking the cake at, at pumping the, the, the division one uh, commits. Um, there's a ton of division three commits coming out of the OJ and the NOJ and, um, and, and as well as uh, Saskatchewan and, and um, uh, even Alberta. Uh, the, the big thing is is that uh, they've just got to be put in the right spots to, to be seen. And, and some of the, the junior leagues are giving great um, opportunities to these guys with showcases and added extra events so that these NCAA coaches can come and see them. Uh, and not to interrupt, I just jump in on, on the commitment thing. It's important, too, to – you know, make sure you do your research as to where those commitments come from, because a lot of times these leagues will just tout their their basic numbers. Like we have this many D1 players. I think of a, an example, the Penticton V's year after year load their team up with previously committed players. So they're a great program. 
they're a wonderfully run program. They develop players well. They're successful. But if you say, you know, we have 20 committed players to the NCAA, it doesn't mean you got those players, their commitments. A lot of them were committed already. So if you're a parent that's thinking, I want to go to the NCAA level and you're looking for the right spot, you have to consider who is getting players from no commitments to commitments versus, you know, who has them that, that are already committed and try to figure out the right place and who has players playing the roles that my kid would play and who has openings uh, where they actually have an opportunity to showcase themselves. And the other thing that, that I have found in, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan especially is teams in Manitoba and Saskatchewan do a really good job the last five, six years with their younger players and finding them scholarships. And then what happens is, is you get agents or schools that decide, well, no, you know what, now that you got your scholarship, we want you to go to the USHL or the NAHL or the BCHL. We want you to play against better players and see how you do before you, you come down and, and play for us. So that I think that's a battle that Manitoba and Saskatchewan in particular are, are facing right now is that, you know, they'll get a, a, a kid a scholarship uh, through playing in their program. And if he's got any eligibility in junior left, it's hard to hang on to them. They, they, the kids seem to go on and, and uh, you know, greener pastures or whatever you want to call it. And I, I think I would caution families there as well. And, 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 you know, it's different for everybody. I mean, if you, if you get a kid who's a really good hockey player and he's comfortable in a, in a setting that's close to home and he gets a scholarship and someone whispers to him, well, you know what, maybe you should go to BC. It's better hockey or whatever the reason may be. Um, there's other things at play there that could come into um, the ability to play hockey. If that kid, and we talked about it in the previous segment, if that kid hasn't developed, um, you know, physically or, or mentally and, and is maybe not ready to move away from home, that can impact what happens to you on the ice, you know. And if you've got a team, say, in Winkler, and you had a prominent role last year and you got a scholarship, well, chances are pretty good you're going to be a first-line player for Winkler again with your scholarship in hand as opposed to going to a strange province, to a strange coach who doesn't know you, to a strange lineup where you got to prove yourself all over again and all you need is one or two bad breaks or a coach that doesn't like you. And, you know, they say scholarships are guaranteed. I can tell you that they certainly are not. You know, you can lose just as much as you've, as you've earned them. Harry, it's funny. I get your word on this it can happen. I haven't heard from you yet, Harry. Uh, Ryan, Ryan brings up a point about barriers and not having them in Ontario. Lists in Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Do you think that having these lists as a coach, as an organization in Manitoba, provides a benefit? Or is it another hurdle that you need to continue to work with so that you don't lose those players? But like Mike said, scholarships aren't guaranteed. So, well, I'll just I'll kind of touch on everything. I'll start with that question. But, uh, yeah, I, what I really like is auto protect. Um, say you're a top prospect uh, out of Brandon, Manitoba. You're going to go in the top five picks. But Brandon doesn't choose till 15. So now you go to Everett. So the rink is five minutes from your parents' house. You grow up watching them. You own all the jerseys, all your favorite player weekend. But now you got to pack up and drive halfway across the continent to play in the same league you could play in in your back door. So I know you're thinking, okay, well, you, know, you could stack a team. You know, you could have great players in every region. I mean, I'm sure Everett would rather have local products, ideally, play for their team that are high-end players. You, know, you get that auto protect out of the way. Every team gets one or two guys in their area. And then you can start the draft from there. I'm sure your middle of the pack guys are happy to go anywhere. But the elite of the elite shouldn't have to necessarily move all the way across the country to play at the exact level that they have in their backyard. Um, as for a list, I think – well, back uh, not too long ago, when players can be persuaded with you know the the, the envelope in your parents' mailbox with a couple bucks, in it, you know. So if you're a team and you're trying you're to that doesn't still happen <laughs> without a list, you know, the team with the, the deep pockets at a junior level could could do whatever they want. So it, it definitely levels the playing field. And what Ryan said is. Yeah, if I get drafted to Team B that charges 500 a month, or Team A that charges 500, well, why is that? Like, why do I get punished? Right, I didn't choose to go to that team. 
and my parents got to pay an extra grand. Why? You know, so there needs to be some kind of uh, adjustment to that. You know, unless every fee was the exact same. Um, you know, again, the, the incentive that gets the you know, the kids outside the province, well, you can't control that. It's a little bit of an honor system. But, uh, yeah, I can see the the advantages of both. Um, you know, I think uh, the draft process is fun for coaches and else to do at this level. And, you know, uh, I think everybody likes to feel like it makes it more competitive when you can kind of start getting kids at a younger age. But just in terms of issues with uh, dealing with people who, who get a scholarship with you, I want to bowl. We we got a situation like that. Kids who are have scholarships are being told to go out there. Not that Western League players in the bubble are being told not to come. Like we got that here too. So these are the conversations we're having every day. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I can say what is best and what you know. I can just say what I like depending on the situation I'm in. But I can see you know this being beneficial to some places. But you know. It's, it depends. As a player, I like the freedom. As a coach, I like the control. Well, that's the both sides of it. And I think that's a great way to end the second period. I see the Zamboni rolling out behind me. We're going to talk <laughs> in the third period about this current year. And we're going to get everybody's perspective with regards to what it will look like as we foreshadow six, seven months away from here to this upcoming Bantam draft. And stay with us here on the Coach's Parlay. Are you looking for a career in the salon industry? Check out Aveda Institute Winnipeg in the exchange. What sets us apart is our student mentorship program, 95% placement rate after graduation, real-world salon experience, and network of 7,000 salons and spas. You will learn creative cut and coloring, latest trends and techniques, social media marketing, fashion shows, photo shoots, and more. Now accepting applications for 2018, so check us out and book your tour today. Aveda Institute Winnipeg, hair school the way it should be. So our third period topic is still talking about the Bantam draft as well as all draft years. The last period we were able to talk about the proper vocabulary and the language. I want to thank everybody for their input on there. More importantly, when it comes to this upcoming year, this is going to look different than probably a lot of other years we've had in the recent past. We're not probably going to see the amount of fans in the stands. We're not going to see the opportunity for a lot of players perhaps to be seen all over you know, products like ourselves at Amateur Sports TV, I mean, where we're able to go into a rink, videotape a game, potentially profile a player that's going to be at that bantam level, give them their opportunity to have a videotape, a little bit of work on social media, all of that put together. And I think it's a great idea, you know, because if you are looking forward to getting to that next level, then you're saying to yourself as a dad or as a coach, you're not doing everything you can to promote your team or promote your player to that next level. Finding a program like ASTV to do that would be a great thing. But at the same time, how is it that we're going to see this year's Bantam draft look uh, for both players and teams in this current situation we're in? I want to start with Ryan on this because I will start with you. Let's get your feedback on, you know, the fact that, Ranks are going to look different. Players are going to be playing different. But how do we make it the best foot forward for these youngsters and their first year of eligibility to be looking to play at the next level? Well, I I know that things are looking kind of grim here in Ontario when it comes to what we're going to be able to do with, with, with hockey, period. Um, you know, they're talking – Four on four, they're talking, going to practice until January. There's really no hockey in sight here um, coming up. And 
Um, it's really affecting a lot of the minor midget age group here. Um, that's the draft here in Ontario um, and not Bantam. And um, they're talking like there's not going to be any ability to play in a league where these players are going to then go based on their, their Bantam seasons. And there's a lot of development that happens uh, over the course of a summer between Bantam and minor midget. And, um, you know, some kids peak and some kids continue to flourish and do really well. So, um, so there's a lot of concern for a lot of the minor midget age group kids here as to, are they going to be seen? Who's going to be the ones that are going to be known and have the scouts in the area really have the ability to, to break them down, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of what's going on here. Mike. There, I think I was muted. Um, yeah, we didn't want to hear you the first for me, minute anyway. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, I think this COVID has, has just been discriminatory on young people. And and it's dis discriminatory because of politicians, um, not because of COVID. I mean, we, we've got all kinds of evidence out there that kids are at no risk of this virus. And especially when you've got families and, and, and coaches and everybody that are willing to move ahead. Um, I just, I can't believe, like, at some point, are we going to fight back? Like, when I, when I hear Ryan talk about what's going on in Ontario, like, these are people's lives. And, yeah, you might be saving somebody who's 84, but you're destroying thousands of people that are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And there's just no, like, 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 I'd love to know what the rationale is for somebody when they say, well, you know what, we might let you play four on four because five on five spreads the virus. Yeah. Like, come on, you guys. And it's just, it's, it's maddening to me. And, and, you know, I can, you know, I, when I speak from a, a, a prairie perspective in, in Saskatchewan, I mean, it's, you know, we're taping this show. It's September 9th. We don't know what we're allowed to do. What, and forget Junior A. It's Bantam, Pee Wee. Now I'm calling them by their old terms, but I mean that's that's what I use. We know um, what you mean, Mike. You know, they they don't know what they can do. They don't know what they're going to be allowed to play. They don't know who who they're going to be allowed to play, and they don't know what the structure is. And to say that, well, you know what? It might be a year of practice. That's nonsense. You still got the same amount of guys on the ice. You still got the same amount of interaction you're you're still doing the same things the virus if it's going to spread will spread on the ice whether you're practicing or playing and at some point people have got to start fighting back because when i look at at phantom graphs and, and things like that the damage that's being done is irreversible like we talk about development and some guys develop early and some guys develop late well right now you've got you know a group of kids I don't care what anybody says. You you don't develop by practicing for a full year. You gotta play games because part of developing is learning how to win and learning how to utilize your teammates and learning how to compete in that kind of a game environment. And you know, I can tell you just you know, just from other extracurricular activities, they'll say like in schools, they'll say, Oh, well, we're gonna have soccer, soccer's a go, we're just not playing any games. Well, nobody signs up. I mean, I mean, and at some point we, I mean, and I know that most of us, we want to be good and we want to obey the rules and we want to do what's right. But at some point we got to look at it and go, this isn't right. And it's not just Bantam kids, but it's, it's everybody all the way up. And, um, you know, it drives me crazy when I hear someone say, oh, well, you know what? It's just hockey. It's not just hockey. It's not. I mean, these are the lives of people that have invested into their future. And whether that's hockey and whether they're 13, 14, 15, 16, all of them are affected. And, you know, when I hear Ryan talk about what goes on in Ontario, it just, it's maddening. And yet at the same time, I fear that we're not really any further ahead on the prairies, even though I look around and I, why? Yeah. Sean, what's well, your take on the whole, uh, how it will look this year? And I'm going to ask you and Harry the same question here. 
can you take tape from a previous year, like a, even a 14 or 15 year old year, even though this season might be shortened or might look a little different and say, ah, it's just a little bit, it's an asterisk year. Let's, let's really see what he did. Cause he really put up one heck of a year last year, but we won't really take too much to this consideration to this year. Well, they don't start making their, their books on these players just in the year they're drafted, right? This right. is a process that goes on for a long time. They'll have marked these players to follow for several years and then try to get a closer look and a closer look. I mean, if you're watching Bantams, you saw them in their first year. Um, so y- you'll have noticed them, but maybe not focused as much on them. It's going to play havoc with drafting for sure. And assuming even for a second that the leagues do go ahead as they normally would, you're going to get circumstances. I've already talked to some coaches at different levels of hockey where some players would normally have gone to play at an academy. They've decided as a family, I don't want you to be away during this. You know, I don't want you to go off to BC if you're a Saskatchewan kid, so you're going to stay here. Do they play at a slightly lower level of hockey to do that? If they had to leave home to play double A AA or triple A, do they stay closer to home and play a lower level of hockey in order to be closer to home under these circumstances? And then how does that change the way you're able to evaluate them? Cause they're not playing against that competition. We're not going to have as many um, provincial tournaments or interprovincial tournaments or showcase events. How does that change the way you're able to evaluate? But like I said before on, on this subject, I think, the, the people that that part of it plays the most havoc with are those drafting um, for these teams. That'll make it a, a much tougher draft. But for the players themselves, as long as they can play and develop, again, it won't matter where you get drafted as a bantam. It'll matter how you develop as a player. The thing I'm worried about for players is whether they're in uh, peewee or bantam or, you know, junior aged players like i think of the western hockey league the conversation we had last time about whether that league can operate if the teams can't operate or they operate less um what is that going to mean for those players and their development how much will that handicap the progress they're able to make and what steps can be taken in order to ensure there's an opportunity to make sure they still are able to develop properly i mean i'm not smart enough when it comes to coaching development of players to know what some of the answers could or should be. And I certainly don't understand all the regulations, nor am I going to weigh in as to what they should or shouldn't be, because I just don't know, but there needs to be some solutions for players um, to make sure that they're not stalled. That's not life or death, but it's certainly extremely important to them. So there needs to be some alternatives. And I'm, I imagine even at the highest level, if you're in the NHL right now and you're worried about what's going to happen in major junior or junior A, you got an eye on it because those are your future talents too. So you want to make sure that there's a way for those players to to develop and work in their game and take steps forward. Harry, you got to Matt, you got to look a couple years ahead now. I mean, this is going to look different this year, but like Sean said, the book wasn't just made today; it was a couple years ago. You've got an eye on some players. You know, the door is still open for everybody, of course. Like Sean has put together this. I think that's his message of the day. Just because you don't get drafted doesn't mean the door is shut. But you as an organization now have to look at this as a different style of year. Perhaps it's a way to look at the players' strength and mentality based on the fact that this is a brand new situation that a lot of players haven't faced. What is your take on looking for this year's draft uh, potentially upcoming years well we started off by talking about is the bantam draft too young if there's every year to set it correctly this would be it well these kids are born give them another year move it up to minor midget now if you're a second year bantam this year or u15 or whatever they call it you know what now we're going to push the bantam draft maybe there is no bantam draft this year you know maybe they restructure that we pick it up next year you know but my biggest concern is I think the biggest issue that surrounds hockey compared to any other sport is the cost. So if I'm paying if I'm playing AAA, it costs about thirty five hundred dollars registration. That's your all in before your travel. Um, if hockey's not starting, well now you, all these kids are getting skills coaches. They're buying their own ice. 
the AJ and BC are charging $2,000 a month per player in development fee for the first three months. 30 kids can be there. I don't know too many junior A teams that are, um, you know, bring in $60,000 a month in revenue on a, on a good year, but these guys are charging all this money and, and parents are paying. That's, you're going to have guys that prey on the desperation of these kids and parents wanting to be seen. There's a lot of unsanctioned showcase events going on. You, it's your draft year. Uh, these coaches and scouts are going to watch on hockey TV. Come pay $300 for three ice times. And kids are going. It was in one in Alberta. There was 120 kids. Again, there was. you can't play a sanctioned game because of COVID, but there's all of these loopholes. ECHL can't start till December, but they're scheduling exhibition games for October. So I don't really understand. I feel like the more you delay the season, um, the more the cost is going to go up for these parents to try to find alternatives to, to showcase themselves, to develop themselves. And you know what? Kids are skating. People are going to ranks. It doesn't make any sense. I'm kind of on the same page as Mike here. Like, let's just go. Like, we're Manitoba is gearing up. We're you know we're following the protocols. We're making sure we do all we can. But at the end of the day, we waste a year of hockey for these guys. You're only going to create more issues down the down the line. You know. So there's just no. You, you you look at what's going on right now, and and you know. Yeah people say the United States is a bad example, but you know what? College football is happening. It's been happening for two weeks. It's been happening in front of tens of thousands of fans. The NFL is starting this week. They're going to play in front of tens of thousands of fans. Um, there's just no evidence whatsoever to suggest that allowing hockey to move forward in Canada, that somehow we're going to be Northern Italy and have no hospital. Like, like there, there is no evidence of that. And so to me, all you're doing is discriminating against young people and in particular, young athletes. And somebody somewhere, fight back. Like, I mean, we want to obey the rules, but at some point, I mean, we don't even know what the rules are. Like, like you know, Sean said, well, you know, I don't know. Well, nobody knows. Like, like can we say, you know, like, well, what is the standard that needs to be in order for hockey to go? Nobody knows. And then as Harry says, well, some of them are already doing it. There's some unsanctioned hockey over here. You're hearing there's stories of, you know, people not following the rules and using dressing rooms or not necessarily getting ready in the parking lots like they're supposed to do. And you know what? We're not Northern Italy. So let's go. Everybody, the, the kids, the families, the coaches, the billets, the trainers, they know the risks. And my guess is the fans know the risk too, and they're still going to show up. So at some point when you have that many people who know the risks and are still willing to do it, yeah, let them do it. Ryan, we're going to introduce you right now. It's our last segment. The game's all over. We're back in the dressing room. Give you your 30-second shift, your final thoughts on what you thought, what you think you will see this year when it comes to – reviewing players and giving them the opportunity to put their best foot forward. Hi, I just think that uh, hopefully everything will, will, will work itself out here. And um, I liked how Mike mentioned the politicians involved. I think these politicians that are the ones that are involved are the ones that are, are just making things more difficult than they need to be. Um, I have a 2015 year old son. He's uh he's, going to be six in February and uh, our local association canceled this age group because of COVID. Like that, that's, that's, that's our, that's our bread and butter of development years for these young kids not being able to, uh, to play. And are, are, are they going to play next year? Are they going to show up? Are they going to want to play again? You know, maybe their passion is not there anymore, you know, and they don't understand. They, they know COVID's around, but I just hope that things, uh, get back on the street and narrow and cooler heads can prevail here. That's, uh, that's what I would like to see. That's for sure. Harry, you're next up. Um, I mean, I just came from a major triple A tryout. I mean, I'm, everybody looks like they're having fun. You know, you're, you're at the rink. Everybody's cautious. Everybody, it's the elephant in the room, but like we're going through with it. I mean, hopefully the next time, you know, all of us get together, you know, we would have already played three, or three exhibition games. Hopefully this is the last time we really have to talk about this. I know we probably have a few more conversations left, but 
I don't know. I'm on the edge of these kids. We were out yesterday, tomorrow, and they're having so much fun. I can't imagine going through a, a quarantine pandemic in minus 40 when you're stuck inside. Like, you got to get out. It's going to be dark at 4 o'clock before we know it. We need hockey. Yeah. Team Salmon, let's start with Mike. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I – I'm actually, you know, despite my ranting and raving, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that in Saskatchewan, they're going to give us the, the green light to go. Um, the, the big issue might be the, you know, staggering and, you know, do you let everybody go at once or do you kind of start it and let the junior A's and the U18s go first um, to sort of minimize traffic in, in each, you know, community arena. So that might be um, an issue as well, but, you know, I I am you know you know despite my ranting and raving, I am cautiously optimistic uh, that it is going to be a go. But the other thing in Saskatchewan is we've got an election at the end of October, and sadly, you've got a lot of selfish politicians that feel like if they green light hockey, and there happens to be ten or twelve cases across the province, that maybe the voters will make them pay for that. And so I do wonder. Uh, if they're going to drag this out just a little bit past the election and then say, okay, you can play now because they'll have the five-year mandate. Sean? I don't know about the, the political side of it. And, and again, you know, there's not much people in hockey can do outside of make noise if they want to make noise to, to make a difference. But you said sort of the message that I'd been sending on this show is that um, one year – one six month period, one thing that happens to you, and try not to focus on on that as the end of the road. You know, if you're a, a family member or a you know a parent, a player that's watching this show, I'm not a high level athlete. I never was. I'm not a high level coach. I never was. But I've watched enough hockey and followed enough to know that one year doesn't make or break any individual hockey player. So do the best you can to make the most out of this year. If it results in you not being drafted high. It's not the end of the world. There'll still be opportunities. If that results in you not playing as high a level as you normally would have, find other ways to develop. There's still lots of road left ahead. If you don't get drafted in the Bantam draft, you can still find your way into the Western Hockey League or Junior A. If you don't get drafted in the NHL, you can play Canadian or American University. You can play minor pro. Still find a way to get to the highest level. Countless athletes have done it. We focus too much on the here and now. There is lots of opportunity ahead. One year won't make or break anyone's career. So try not to be too discouraged as we go through this process. I think that's the optimism of the glass, half full of optimism. I wish it was all full of optimism. A little bit of speculation, some theories of all. I do appreciate everyone joining us here tonight. Ryan, thanks for joining us. I hope to see you again next time as well. Great to get the insight in Ontario. I wasn't familiar in that attitude and that mindset of putting your money where your potential is is something that i you know didn't really think about and it truly is becoming more of a forefront issue for younger kids and families making that decision and like you said harry you know i coached in southern california so i know how much money is spent on ice time on development months and how much these junior programs that are slightly affiliated with nhl programs spend on kids and everybody whose parents spend way too much money as far as I'm concerned. If you have the talent, like you said, Sean, they'll find a way. The door will be left open for you. You will get your shot. And Mike, I appreciate the uh, the calmness of the politicalness. I'll put it that way, put it lightly. Uh, appreciate all the work, gentlemen. Look forward to doing this in a couple more weeks with our next topic here on the Coaches Parlay. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you in a couple weekends from now. Take care. Enjoy some bubble hockey. And I'm sure we'll get some feedback here as more camps, more regular camps start firing up here on the prairies. And we hope to see a little bit more uh, insight from Ontario through Ryan in the coming weeks. Again, thank you very much. Take care. Enjoy the show. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.